Hello, South Knoxville Church of God. Welcome guests. We're glad you're here with us tonight. We're getting ready to get into the Word here in just a few moments, and Brother Gary Parrott will be bringing forth the message for you tonight. We're glad to have him. We are very honored to have the ministers of the church that, that are here, and I want to give them opportunity. But it's not just giving them opportunity. God has a word for you, and, and I'm expecting that you will be greatly encouraged and blessed by this word. Before we get into that, let's go to the Lord for a word of prayer. And if you have prayer requests, you're welcome to leave them in the comment section below this video, or you can send them to us by going to skcog.com and click on prayer request. Now let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather here, even though it may be virtually, we're gathering, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And you said where two or three are gathered in your name, there you're in the midst. We know that you're here. We believe, God, that you're going to move, Lord, and I pray that the anointing that is upon this word that, that will come through, Brother Gary Parrott, Lord, through this camera to those who are watching, God, would, would increase their faith, would give them courage for another day. God, I pray that your anointing would fall upon them as well as they receive this word. May you be glorified, may your church be uplifted, and may Brother Gary be anointed as he brings forth this word. God bless you. We're glad you're here. Let me remind you that you are precious in the sight of God and that tonight he wants to speak to your spirit. Here's Brother Gary. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. I have been into church uh, off and on all my life. I started out here at four years old in the old church and uh, went till I was the age of 18. I left and, and I was gone for 20 years. I was actually out in the world, lost for 20 years. And I knew I had a praying mother because there was things that I was doing that I shouldn't have survived. And I'm just being honest with you. Uh, she prayed for me. Uh, I could feel her prayers. And uh, when I did come back, uh, I come right back to this church. I came back with the intent of just doing nothing but sitting and listening. I wanted to hear what God really had to say. And, and folks, for people that want to do that, let me tell you, God is not a person that will allow you to be a bench warmer. He is a participatory God. He wants you involved. So uh, all the things that I said I would never do, I told him, you know, I don't want to sing in a choir. I don't want to teach anything. I just want to do, you know, as I sit and listen. And as I did that, of course, the pastor and, and, and the choir director would ask, you need to sing in a choir with us. And no, I don't want to. Well, six months later, I'm singing in a choir, uh, you know, been back about two or three years, was getting rooted and grounded in the Word, and the pastor come to me and says, I'd like you to take the 45-plus uh, Sunday school class. And No, I don't, I don't want to teach. I don't want to teach. Uh, three months later, I was teaching the 45-plus Sunday school class. So uh, be careful what you tell God you don't want to do, okay? Uh, don't ever tell him you don't want to go to Africa because he will send you there. Okay, uh, don't tell him that you don't want to go to the poor part of town because he will send you there. So uh, I left and started a church with uh, another pastor. We were together for 16 years, uh, did some evangelistic work, and the church closed. And when it closed, uh, me and my wife, Teresa, we prayed very hard about what to do. We visited area churches. And we felt like God was drawing us back to South Knoxville. So here we are. We came back. So that's my testimony, and I'm sticking to it. So as we begin tonight, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Romans chapter 8. To me, when Paul wrote Romans, we know that it should have been one letter. It, it's not chapter broken into chapters. It, it was one whole letter. Uh, and we can tell, even reading, when Paul really gets under the anointing as he's writing, uh, some of his, his words kind of start speeding together as the verses uh, come together. But anyway, we're going to be in Romans 8 tonight. We're going to start at verse 31. And, and the title, if there is anything tonight, is What Shall We Say? 
It says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Number one, what things? What things is Paul talking about there? Well, he's talking about the first 30 verses in the, in the chapter. And, and the second part, there's two questions there. What shall we say to these things? And then the second question is, if God be for us, who can stand against us? Folks, that right there ought to just tickle you to death. If God is with us, who can absolutely stand against us? So now, what shall we say to these things? The first thing that we can say is, what about creation? Okay? Now, this may be going back a little far, but stick with me for a minute. God created the perfect world for his children to live on, Adam and Eve. The oxygen was just right. The sunlight was just right. Everything was perfect. Okay? And he made this creation so that he could have his children live on it. The second thing in this part is now we're going to move up. I'm, I'm jumping really fast here. Um, Jesus' life. What, what can we say about Jesus' life? What do we say to these things? Look what he did. I mean, he was the second head in the Godhead Trinity. He was sitting at his Father's right hand. And he, because his Father said he had to, he chose, he had to, uh, he had a choice. He could have done it or not done it, but he did it. He come to this earth and he walked as a man. He grew up. He grew stronger. The Bible says that he waxed strong in, 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 in physical and in knowledge. He was teaching at the temple at the age of 12. Now, I know if I'd have walked off from one of my kids and them 12 years old and not missed them for three days, somebody had been coming after me. But back then, evidently, it wasn't much. So in his life, he had miracles. We see these miracles in past tense. How could you walk in that nation and at that time and watch a man raise somebody from the dead? Not by touching them. Not by giving them CPR, but just by simply saying, come forth. See, so in his life, he created miracles. He died for us. He was crucified for us. What a comfort to know that God, when he made this creation, he had all this planned out. I'll tell you this, God has everything planned out. There's nothing that we would ever go through that will surprise God. There's nothing that you can fall into that he doesn't already have a way to get you out of. If you'll listen. If you'll listen. Even though we carried that sin nature, he still loved us. It says John 3.16. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a promise. What a promise, church, that we have, that we have a God that loves us this much. See, it took the life of that spotless lamb, Jesus Christ, to cover all of our sin stains. Every person in the world has that promise. Whether they fall to it or not is up to them, but every person in the world is given that promise of being saved. No matter the gender, no matter the color, uh, he died so that we might be set free from that sin bondage. Because of his sacrifice on the cross and his burial and his resurrection, he made a way back to the arms of the Father. We were lost. We had no way. We couldn't have bought our way back. We couldn't have worked our way back. It had to take Jesus Christ dying on that cross for us to come back. How do we turn away from such a, a promise? How do we turn away or deny such a life-altering gift that he has given us? What comfort it is to know someone loved me enough that they would die for me and die for you. He didn't think of the cost. He didn't care about what it was going to cost. All he knew was that he wanted us back. He wanted us back with him. And so he paid the price and as he did, he suffered the injustice of the human world. 
He suffered the injustice of laws that weren't meant to hold him and bind him. He was beaten and abused. He hung on a wooden cross, so marred that his own mother didn't know him. His body, we won't go into the graphics, but it was literally torn to part. The only thing that didn't happen to his body was the bones were broken. And that was prophesied in Isaiah that a bones, his bones wouldn't be broken. You think back, no wonder he cried in the garden. I know what's coming. I know it. He knew all along what was coming. He knew the pressure that was going to be put on him. He knew what he was going to have to bear. But yet, nevertheless, Lord, not mine, but your will be done. His confidence in the Father gave us confidence in the Savior, Jesus Christ. How can we deny so great a power? Romans 8.11 says that we are adopted into God's family through the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says that. We are so loved by our Father that He hears our every heart's cry. We were talking earlier before all of this, I was talking about prayer. And, and you don't have to be a theologian to pray. You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to pray. You don't have to have a thesaurus or a Webster's Dictionary beside you to pray. When you're in trouble, the best prayer, we said it earlier, is help. God knows your heart. He knows what you need even before you ask. Our heart's cries are carried by the Holy Spirit in a voice that we cannot even understand. Verse 14. Romans 8, 1 says, that, Therefore, no condemnation to them who love God and walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, if we were in a battle of condemnation, this doesn't come from God. According to the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus, sin is dead. So what condemnation comes to us is coming from the Father of all lies. God doesn't condemn, He convicts. And as He convicts, He also rebukes sometimes. These, these things that God does to us, they get stiffer the longer we don't listen. Okay, first He convicts you. That's like saying, okay, you know you did wrong. Straighten up. Next comes the rebuke, okay? Look, I've told you once, now I'm going to tell you twice. You've done wrong. Straighten up. The third time, there's usually a test or a trial or a tribulation that comes into play. And in that point, he's putting you in a situation or a circumstance where you will have to learn what he wants you to learn. If you're in love with him, if you're one of his children, then you'll understand. If God condemns me, it will be after he has done everything to reconcile me to him, back to him. And then only after I have crossed back over the blood of Jesus Christ in denial. And condemnation still won't come until the judgment after I'm done passed away. So God will never condemn children. He will convict, he will rebuke, and he will put you in places that you may be uncomfortable, but it's for your own good. Romans 8, 15 through 18. For you have not received a bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adopt adoption whereby you can cry, Abba, Father. Abba, that's like daddy. It's, it's funny, as I looked that word up, Abba, both of them, the Greek and the Hebrew, which comes from the Chaldean form. Now we're going a little history here. Uh, the Greek form is Abba, which means father. And the Hebrew, which is Ab, just A-B, and then it means father also. But if you get the Chaldean in there, it's Alb, A-W-B, and it means forefather, it means chief, it means uh, the ones that have come before. So it, it really does mean something closer than just 
Father. Father is the correct term we used when we talk to God. If we're praying in our Pentecostal voices, Father, please. Okay? But when you really want to get close to Him and you really want Him, you know, you need Him quick. Uh, Abba, you know. Abba. Jesus cried Abba in, in the garden. He was telling Him, Dad, look. You know? So he says here that whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children. Now this is where it gets good. We are the children of God. And this is also at this point between verse 15 and verse 32 is where Paul starts speeding up his, his presentation. And I believe that as he's writing this, I really do, I believe the anointing. Of course, we all know that I were all anointed by the Holy Ghost to write the Bible, okay? From Genesis to Revelation, every man that took a pen to paper was anointed by the Holy Ghost. And you know yourself, sometimes when that anointing gets on you and it starts to move really fast, sometimes you can't get the words out quick enough. And I believe the latter part of Romans 8 is what's happening to Paul. He's, he's in the Spirit and the, and, and, the, and the Holy Ghost is just blowing him up. He's just trying to do everything he can to write as fast as he can. And, of course, you know, writing in Greek, they got a lot more to write than what we do in English. So, and if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We talked about it a little earlier about talking about the persecution that's coming to the church. I don't want to get into that right now, but I do want to say this. Yes, we'll be persecuted, but we have to look at it as our Savior was persecuted. So as, as we live this life, the persecutions, may we may never go to prison. We may never be beaten. We may never have to stand in a court of law and say, I am a Christian. But if we do, then we are in right fellowship and in the same boat as with Jesus Christ. So if we have to suffer for him one day, just like he was glorified when he ascended to heaven and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, he is glorified today. The angels are still now around him singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And as they do that, one day we will be in that place with him where we will be glorified. The Bible says that one day the saints will come marching in. That's where that old song comes from from years ago. That the saints will come in and they will be singing a song that the angels cannot sing or do not understand because it's the song of the redeemed. It's a redemption song of how Jesus Christ saved us from sin. What a great relief is that we can say, Abba. We can, we can get to that personal point with him. We can get to that where we can get alone, where we can be ourselves and we can Show him that we love him in a way that sometimes we have a hard time doing in, in a, in a uh, corporate sense. Some people don't like to raise their hands. Some people don't like to shout amen. Some people don't even like to move sometimes. And, and you have to worry about them. What are they really feeling? But this part of Romans... It's so uplifting. It's so encouraging because it's letting us really see what God thinks about us and, and what He feels about us. And we know that Paul was from East Tennessee for the next verse says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Think about that. Why, do, why is it that we study on the hard stuff? We linger on those things that hinder us or hurt us or harm us. We, we stay around those things that drag us away from, from Scripture, from prayer, from God. We, we, we hover in the, in the gray areas. We don't have to. These sufferings that we're going through now, 
Now, and, and you may not have had a suffering. You will. I'm not being, well, I might be a little prophetic, but Christians do suffer. Uh, and I think that's one of the harm that we do to a lot of young Christians is we forget to tell them at the moment of their salvation, oh, you're going to, there will be suffering. There will be things that come against you and you're going to have a fight. We, we have forgot to tell them that being a Christian is the hardest. Other than marriage, being a Christian is the hardest you will ever do. The hardest thing you'll ever do. And it says, so even though we're going to suffer now, we're going to be glorified later. The Bible says that we go from glory to glory to glory. Well, in between them glories, that's the hilltops, there's valleys that we have to go through to reach each glory. So if we can say Abba, and we are adopted into the king's house, we are the king's kids. That sounds a little simplistic, but my goodness, let's be simplistic. That's what we are. We are his children. We are the king's kids. The, the, and the Spirit declares it in verse 16 that we are heirs through the blood of Jesus Christ, co-heirs with our Savior Jesus Christ, and to have all the promises of our Father. Now make sure you get that. We are heirs to all of the promises of God. From Genesis to Revelations, whatever promises in the Bible is ours. Now, I know some people say, well, we don't believe in the Old Testament or we don't study, study it because there's, there's promises in there that, that do jump over. There's promises in the New Testament that if you didn't have them in, in the Old Testament, they wouldn't be in the New Testament. I'm just telling you. Go back to your Old Testament. Look at some of the promises God made to the, to the house of, uh, of Israel. So if we're co-heirs with Jesus Christ, then we are also co-heirs to all the powers through Jesus Christ. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, when we get this in our spirit and we understand what this means, we are co-heirs to the power or with the power of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in the Gospels, he said, greater things than these you will do because I go to the Father. Greater things than what? What's greater than, than raising somebody from the dead? It's not the act. It's, it's, it's the numbers. Greater things than numbers will you do. Yeah, raising the dead is about as good as you can get, I guess, with miracles. So, but look at how many people you've heard through history that have been brought back from the dead through the power of somebody praying for them. I think I told the pastor this last Sunday. He was talking about uh, a miracle, and, and uh, my pastor, old pastor, was a missionary, and he was gone. He was on the mission field for 20 years in Africa, and a lady had brought her husband dead to the service. They were going to have his funeral after the service. And she had placed him under the grandstand. And sometime during that service, he came to life. He came to life. Been dead three days. And came and rose. So... God is still on the throne. God still works. Jesus' power is still powerful. And folks, we have that promise of Jesus' power in us. Romans 8 and 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to my purpose. No, His purpose because my purpose is mess it up, and it has in the past. But it's according to his purpose. I wrote here, when I'm in love with God, there may be valleys and darkness, but it doesn't matter what I go through. Everything's going to work out 
to my good according to His purpose. I may lose a fortune. So did Job. But he got it back seven times. What the enemy means for evil, God will turn to good. It's been proven time and time again. It's probably been proven in your own life. And if you wanted to testify about it, you probably could. Maybe that's what we need one day. It's just an old-fashioned testimony service. No devil, no no thanking the devil for anything, but, you know, because a lot of people do. They'll get up and testify. Well, you know, the devil's been on me all week. Well, maybe you... There's some reason he's on you. There's two reasons, actually. One, you're either doing exactly what God wants you to do, and you're in perfect partnership with God, or you're slacking off and you're getting ready to drown. That's rough, but I'm... That's the way it is. There's no gray areas. There's no three sides of the fence. There's the left side and the right side, and that's it. If I'm in love with him, like I said, there'd be valleys I'll have to walk through. There's going to be mountaintops that I'm going to soar to. There's going to be rivers I have to cross. But I know this. It'll work out according to his purpose for me. Think of that. He loves me. He loves you. He loves you with an infinite love. Have you ever took a number, just picked a number, and started multiplying it and multiplying it and multiplying it? Pretty soon you get to a number that's outside your realm of comprehension. It's outside your thinking. That's when it becomes infinite. That's when God takes over. His love is not only infinite, but it is everlasting to everlasting. It's a gift for giving him everything. He gives you everything. He can lift you out of your most deepest circumstances, bring you into his presence with a fullness of light. Moving on, Romans 8, 35 through 39. This is where he really gets cranking. This is where Paul is really, I think he's full bore under the anointing and his pen is probably smoking from trying to write so fast. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He says, As it is written all for thy sake. For whose sake? For the Lord's sake. We are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. If you'll read back into Psalms chapter 44, that verse is confirmed. But he says, even after that, nay, in all these things, whether we are slain all day long, whether whatever, whether we are in tribulation, whether we are put in prison, whether we are persecuted, nevertheless, he says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature. Get that. Any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Any creature. Now, Paul gave a whole list of things here that could happen and may happen and will happen to some of us. But he says, through it all, none of this can separate us from the love of God. Whew. I mean, that's, that's powerful. That's, that's uplifting. That's encouraging to know that, yeah, I may have to walk through darkness. Yeah, you may have to walk through darkness. Yeah, you may lose loved ones. And yeah, I may lose loved ones. But through it all, God has not left us here to do it on our own. He's not left us just to say, okay, guys, Sorry, I'm out of here. Church, good luck. Or like they used to uh, kid about Jimmy Carter back in the 70s when it was the end of the Cold War. Somebody said one night, Jimmy sitting there and the Russians was getting ready to bomb and he said, thank you very much, yon yon, good night. He won't do us that way. It's okay to laugh, church. It's okay to laugh. God's got a sense of humor. He made me. He's got a sense of humor. So what do we say to these things if nothing can separate us from the love of God? No matter what I walk through, he goes beside me. Proverbs 18, 24, closer than a brother is what it says. 
It says to be a friend or to have a friend, you have to be a friend. He says, but there is one that walks closer than a brother. So he walks closer than a brother no matter where I'm walking. No matter where I'm stepping. And matter of fact, he's already there ahead of me. I like that old cast and crown songs uh, about where he's talking about God's already there and he's coming and he's standing there looking back. He's looking back at us and he's going, just like Abba, you can do it. Come on. Take that, take that next step. Come on. Step up there. Step up a little higher. I'm here. Come on. He's constantly reminding us, constantly being with us. And wherever he finds me, he'll light my way. Psalms 119, 105 says, He is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So he's always going to light my way. He says that my God loves me. And no matter what comes against me, Psalms 23, 5 says, he says what? He says, I'll set a banquet table in the presence of your enemies. In other words, I'm going to march you right up to your enemies and I'm going to let them see me blessing you. I want them to see that God is on your side. Whew. Glory. I'm telling you, that ought to just make everybody jump for joy. If we was all in one place, we could all run together. Hallelujah. But he will set a place in the presence of our enemies. God loves me and Jesus is always making intercession for me. Sometimes I keep him pretty busy. I don't know about y'all, but I keep him pretty busy. Verse 34 says that that's where he's at. He's at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. What more comforting and positive words can be said than what's been said in Romans 8? Now, there's other chapters in the Bible, don't get me wrong. Uh, you can go back through and, and, and look for yourself. Uh, some may please you, they wouldn't please somebody else. But it may be the period that you're in, the time that you're walking in, that these words resonate to you. Talked earlier about praying the scriptures. And that's great. We should pray the scriptures, okay? And we should read the scriptures. We should understand the scriptures. We should know them. Keep them and write them on the tablets of our heart is what the Word says. But what God lets you read today may not be for today. And it may not even be for you. It may be for you down the road, or it may be for somebody that you meet down the road. So just because God doesn't give you an answer at that moment on that scripture that you're reading, unless it's for clarification, now he'll clarify it. But if it's for something later on, It'll come at the proper time. So what more comforting words in these dark days than Romans 8? I wrote down here, and I, I didn't I hesitate whether to say it, but this is just the way he gave it to me. It's a pump you up chapter. And I don't know if y'all ever watched any of those old TV shows, but there used to be these two guys that dressed up with these fake muscles, and they would sit there and they'd go, we're here to pump you up. And they would talk like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that's, and that's exactly the vision I got when God gave me that, ver, uh, that, that statement. It's the pump you up chapter. It's to let you know that no matter how low you are, God is there to pick you up. No matter what you're going through, God is there to bring you out of it. No matter how dark the night, no matter how cold it is, He's there to brighten your way and to warm you up. He is there 24-7, 365, as they used to say. So it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. I don't care if it's one hour or 50 plus years or 100 years. I don't care if you've slipped away from Him. And you may not be where you're supposed to be. He still loves you. He still wants to draw you closer if you're with him and if you're slipping away he wants to draw you back i think church sometimes we need to be reminded of how much he cares we need to be told that he's always with us we need to understand that no matter where we're at god loves us and i leave you with this Nothing can separate us 
from the love of God. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. This was a great word from the Lord, and we appreciate Brother Gary and, and as I said, the other ministers of the church. God spoke tonight, I believe, through, through him to some of you. And I just pray that as you received this, the, the, the Spirit not only anointed your ears, but anointed your heart to receive. Be encouraged. God's working in these last days. He's doing things. He's working all things together for our good. Let me encourage you that if you're, if you're looking for a, a home, we would love to have you here at South Knoxville Church of God. Uh, if you want to give into a ministry that is uh, a good ministry, good ground, you can, you can give by texting SKCOG to the number 77977, or you can go to the website skcog.com and click on the give button. Um, thank you again for joining, and we are so honored that you chose to be with us today. If you've been blessed by anything that's been said on this video, please feel free to share. We'd love it if you share. It just takes the Word of God even further. God bless you. Have a wonderful night in the Lord.